So what I find is that a lot of people don't even know they have a blood sugar issue. Because when they go to the doctor, the doctor is only looking at their fasting blood sugar. And the fasting blood sugar can be perfectly normal. But after certain meals, it's spiking. Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome to episode number 52 of the Healthy Skin Show. Today, we are going to talk about how blood sugar issues and imbalances can directly impact the health of your skin and the ability for you to rebuild healthier skin. I have personal experience with this because when I began having skin flares, I also was having a lot of blood sugar problems. Now, that doesn't mean that you have blood sugar issues. I did. That was one of my root causes that I had to address. That's why I'm so passionate about this particular topic, because it was something that I've personally dealt with. And I know from experience just how helpful addressing this type of issue can be. Before we dive into that conversation, I want to answer a listener's question. Amber wrote in and asked, I'm wondering if vitamin and mineral deficiencies can cause bad skin rashes. If so, what needs to be looked at? Amber, thank you so much for asking a question like this. It's a good one and one that's oftentimes overlooked by conventional dermatologists. I'm not sure why, because our skin requires so much in the body to be operating optimally in order for the skin to be essentially created healthfully, that we really need to keep our eye on the ball as far as nutrients are concerned. Now, whether your diet is not filled with them or you're not able to absorb them, either way, it's important to take a look at this and get this area under control because it can have a dramatic impact in your skin's ability to rebuild properly. Before I go into a list that I'm just going to kind of rattle off here, just know that we do have a resource here on Skinterrupt that is specific to labs that you can ask your primary care doctor or your GP to run. And depending on where you live, you may be able to actually have these labs run on yourself if you order them through some different companies that are available for you, the consumer, to purchase the labs yourself without having to jump through hoops to get your insurance to pay. So just realize that if you decide to get these labs done on your own, your insurance company will not cover them. You have to go through your doctor in order to get labs covered by insurance. So here's the thing. You really want to look at a combination of different nutrients. Again, this is a sort of short rattled off list, but Vitamin A, vitamin D, and vitamin E, all very critical, and it's important because they are fat-soluble vitamins. You definitely want to get them checked before you begin to supplement because you don't want to end up having too much of them in your system. B-complex vitamins are incredibly important. Um, I would say another fat nutrient is omega-3s. A lot of times people are deficient in omega-3s and consume a lot more of omega-6s, which is the more inflammatory form of lipids. And so you can actually get the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio tested, and that can give you a sense of whether you need to increase your vitamin 3 supplementation or at least increase the amount of things that contain omega-3s. For example, cold water fish like sockeye salmon. Some minerals that can be important are zinc and magnesium, and there are very specific ways to test for those. Doctors will oftentimes want to just run the serum values. You're actually going to request the red blood cell, or RBC, also known as erythrocyte, zinc, erythrocyte, magnesium. These are different. They show you how much of those particular minerals are available to the red blood cells, and the cells essentially, so it's inside of the cell, not what's just floating around in your blood. And that gives us a good sense of what's accessible to the cells themselves. 
Now, here's the other thing. I wanted to throw this out there, even though they're not vitamins and minerals and other nutrients, but something very important to do is to also get your thyroid checked. Having a full thyroid panel can be incredibly helpful because thyroid issues certainly impact the health of your skin. And when you are in a state of low thyroid function, that can cause issues and can be one of the root causes of eczema and other skin conditions. The last thing that I would advise you to check in on is the amount of protein that you consume. First of all, protein is incredibly important. And if you have rashes everywhere, your body actually needs to rebuild that tissue. So you need protein available in order for your body not just to function optimally on any given day, but you need that protein available as a building block in order to have your skin rebuild correctly. That said, a lot of times I found that clients are not consuming enough protein. Collagen is a great supplement, but it cannot be your sole source of protein supplementation because collagen is not a complete spectrum of amino acids, which are the building blocks for protein. A lot of people think that they can just steal the protein that is stored in muscles, and that's not quite the case. Your body is very dependent on a constant supply of protein coming in. And part of the reason why is it's not just your muscles and your tissue itself that requires protein. Your enzymes are built off of protein, as are a lot of the neurotransmitters, your hormones. Um, Some of them are built off of protein, like your thyroid hormone. And so this explains why you can't just go around stealing amino acids from your system, you really need to have that constant supply in order for the body to function healthfully on any given day. So protein intake is required for health in general, as well as if you're in a state where you need to rebuild healthier skin. And oftentimes my clients will find that they feel a boost in energy, mental clarity, and just overall feeling better when they increase their protein intake. My recommendations would be to shoot for somewhere around 70 to 80 grams of protein a day. Now, here's the thing. That might sound like a lot, but it's not that much if you understand how to get that amount into your diet. And if you are more plant-based, protein shakes may be the key to bumping up the amount of protein that you're able to consume. I would highly recommend that you start paying attention to the things in your diet Uh, by looking them up and seeing how much protein is in very specific serving sizes. That way you're able to start eyeballing foods and knowing, okay, well, this hamburger, for example, has about like 23, 24 grams of protein in it, while a half cup of chickpeas, for example, is seven grams. A half cup of whole almonds is 15 grams. One egg is only six grams. So again, the idea is that you begin to pay attention to how much protein is in the food that you eat. That way you don't constantly have to rely on a computer or a website to tell you how to get more protein in. You start to educate yourself. That way you know how much you're getting, not just from animal sources, but also plant sources. And to be aware that yes, while you can get some protein from something like kale, Two cups of kale is only 4.5 grams. So you'd have to eat an awful lot of kale every single day in order to get that 70 to 80 gram mark. That's why protein is such a big piece of this puzzle. It's a critical piece and one that you shouldn't overlook. I hope this list is helpful. And I'll also in the show notes place a link to one podcast that I did a while ago that talks about how to create a protein shake if that's something you're interested in to help boost your protein. I think now would be a great time to transition over and tune in to today's interview all about how blood sugar regulation can impact healthy skin. Hey everyone, today I've got a very special guest. I'm quite honored to have her with me. Her name is Dr. Rita Marie. Many of you probably know of her work. She is quite well-known and incredibly well-respected. And from what I have known of her, because I've had the opportunity to meet her now and get to know her personally, she is truly a wonderful person. So it's an honor to have her here on the Healthy Skin Show. She is a licensed doctor of chiropractic and certification with certifications in acupuncture, nutrition, herbal medicine, and heart math. As the founder of the Institute of Nutritional Endocrinology, 
She specializes in using the wisdom of nature to restore balance to hormones with a special emphasis on thyroid, adrenal, and insulin imbalances. She has trained and certified hundreds of practitioners in the art of using palate-pleasing whole foods as medicine. She's got over 25 years of clinical experience under her belt and now offers online courses, long-distance coaching, counseling, and informative live events. Dr. Rita Marie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and share whatever I can with your, your audience. Well, I know that you you have this trove of information in your brain and for many years of experience, not just working in a clinical setting, but also to training practitioners. And so I figured you'd be the best person to talk about blood sugar because that's really your wheelhouse. I know we were talking before this interview about blood sugar spikes and imbalances and how that could play a role in skin flares. What would you share with someone if they were admitting to the fact that they know that their blood sugar is not in a good spot, they're really struggling, maybe they're not eating such a great diet, lots of sugar and whatnot. How is this connected? Why should they care? Yeah, so there's a number of connections here, and I'll try to make it as simple as possible because the science behind it can be pretty complex. First of all, most people don't realize they have a blood sugar issue. There's a lot of people who know, but majority of people with blood sugar issues don't even know. And they usually only find out when they come to a program that we do and we teach them how to test their own sugars and they're shocked to find either super high spikes or super low valleys. And wow, it's a big thing that happens. So I like to look at the body as an integral whole, right? So when you look at skin, you don't just give people steroids to put on their skin, which is out of your scope, but you, you don't just tell them, oh, here's an alternative to steroids. Take this cream. No, you're looking at, at it from the inside out. So we need to be healthy from the inside out to affect our skin, um, our hair, nails, et cetera. And in particular, the kind of flare ups that people get with, with psoriasis and eczema and other kinds of chronic skin conditions. So the thing that we all have to keep in mind is that the blood sugar regulation is important because every cell in the body needs to get a source of energy, a source of fuel in order to do its thing. So in order for skin cells to be able to reproduce properly and get the right nutrition in, they need to, there needs to be a balance in blood sugar and the escort uh, hormone called insulin. And when all this is working properly and the gut is working properly, because I'm sure you have other people who have talked about the gut in the relationship, to skin, though there's a big connection between blood sugar and the gut health. So when everything's working properly, the body has this ability to heal. And I don't agree with or believe in a this for that approach, although there may be some real nice topicals that they can use to help with the skin while they're working on the root cause. So what I find is that a lot of people don't even know they have a blood sugar issue because when they go to the doctor, the doctor is only looking at their fasting blood sugar. And the fasting blood sugar can be perfectly normal, but after certain meals, it's spiking. And not just the meals you mentioned, which obviously nobody should be eating, right? The sugar and the, the tricks and the, you know, all that kind of stuff that people eat, but even some of the healthier foods that have hidden sources of sugar in them, you know, and things like honey and molasses and all, but also fruit juice. And even for some people, the sweet tropical fruits can cause blood sugar imbalances. And what that can lead to is a condition called insulin resistance, which is where insulin, which is, you know, the escort service for glucose to take it in the cell so the cells can do their thing and repair and nourish themselves. When that over time becomes resistant, the cells go, uh, uh, there's been too much of that stuff in my system for too long and it stops. And when insulin resistance starts, we get a lack of nourishment to all of our cells, skin included. So the skin is a, um, is a recipient and the skin is, is one of our detox organs too, right? So when we get like flooded with too much sugar and that can create an imbalance in the gut of overgrowth of funguses and candida and things like that. And then that can lead to skin problems. So there's a direct route, which I would say is the skin cells not actually getting the fuel supply they need to reproduce themselves properly and to overcome whatever these other stressors are. So that's like kind of sort of, and also insulin resistance can lead to inflammation, which we all know is the underlying cause in skin. Yes. 
And, and inflammation is a huge piece to this. It drives so many problems. And for many people, I mean, even the biologic medications actually cut off specific pathways that generate inflammation. So we know that infl- inflammation is a big deal in this. But you said something that I think a lot of people would be curious to know more about. You mentioned that fasting glucose uh, marker, and it's not really the best marker to go by. So if someone was to download their labs after listening to this, not while, pay attention, everyone. What what marker should they look for or maybe ask if they're headed to the doctor soon to go get their blood work? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Because if they just got the standard lab that the doctor would order, they're not going to see the stuff in there that is um, going to be telling. So there's two markers. One is hemoglobin A1C, which is usually only run after a person is diagnosed as diabetic. And so usually when a person first gets their hemoglobin A1C measured, it's off the charts high because it's not measured as a precautionary early indicator. And it's a great early indicator. If you've got normal fasting blood sugar, let's just say it's 80, which is a really good fasting blood sugar, but your hemoglobin A1C is 5.6, 5.8, 6 or above, that means that your fasting's good, but the rest of the day after you're eating, you're having all these really high levels, right? So it's a really good early marker, hemoglobin A1C and also insulin. Um, So if you just measure insulin, again, it's not even often measured in diabetics unless there's a suspicion that they're a type 1 diabetic, but it's a really good early indicator of overall health status. And so when the fasting insulin is high, and in my opinion, above 5 is high, although labs will say, oh, above 12 is high. I think if you're in that 5 to 12 range, you're already heading for a problem. And as we work with people in an integrative fashion, in a holistic fashion, and a preventable fashion, We want to detect imbalances in the body before they become a diagnosable disease. So we can look at insulin and we want to keep it in the three to five range. And we can look at hemoglobin A1C. And I actually like to keep it in the five to 5.2 range or 4.8 to 5.2. That's getting a little high. That's about as high as I'd want it to go. And most people, when they first test it, this was true for me. I got it tested and I'm like 5.6. That's borderline, right at the borderline of insulin resistance. And that means that for a lot of the time in my waking hours, my blood sugar is going high because I know my fasting is only 80. So I know during the night it's good, but what's happening after we eat? So it's really important that we get this under control. Now, I have another question for you. You know, you have this, this range that you just shared with everybody, but what about when they've had like a comprehensive metabolic panel and they've fasted? Yes. So everybody, if you fast, if you have a blood test, don't exercise in the morning. Just drink some water and go to the lab. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But what if somebody's uh, fasting blood glucose level was 96? So where even just with that, if that's all they have right now, you know, the normal ranges for conventional medicine are so different. Are so bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. So here's what I think. If you're fasting blood sugar is in the 90s or higher, you're, we know you have a problem. There's a problem there, right? And it really ideally should be 75 to 85, you know, to be really optimal or below that. If you're doing more of a ketogenic type of diet, it can be definitely 60s or even 50s for some folks. But that's something else to talk about, right? Because too low isn't good either, unless you're in ketosis. But that's another story for another day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have, a, I have an interesting story. Um, story to share. Some of my listeners have also heard this, that my eczema started while I was in grad school. So it's under a ton of stress for three years. The last year of grad school was when my dyshydroidic eczema started. And at the time, I also had these crazy blood sugar swings that would happen during the day where I would get so groggy and out of it at like two o'clock that I'd have to go lay down for two or three hours. And I started putting on weight. I really didn't feel well. um, And I came to discover, so like you, I asked for my hemoglobin A1C to be tested and was right on the border of being pre-diabetic. And I started to freak out. So can, you know, having skin issues in and of itself is incredibly stressful and traumatic, not just the daily worry about 
is my skin gonna flare up today? Is it gonna be a good day or a bad day? Or if you're in the middle of a flare and you're in a lot of pain or up all night itching, whatever. So can you talk a little bit about how stress, the stress that we experience, like can that impact your blood sugar as well? Oh my God, yeah, it's one of the major causes. In fact, it's a physiologic process to cause the blood sugar to go up during stress. Because think about it, stress as a, as a biological mechanism that evolved over time was actually something that is to protect us from predators. That tiger's chasing me. That lion's chasing me. I got to get away. And so the mechanism is when we perceive stress, our blood sugar goes up, our cortisol goes up because that's what the adrenals do. It produces cortisol. And one of cortisol's jobs is to raise the blood sugar and the blood pressure and the heart rate and the respiration rate, so you can get away from the tiger. Your skin is not a tiger. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, and, and grad school, studying and all that, there's no tiger there, and you're not physiologically needing that blood sugar there. To You know, you need the blood sugar when you're going to be running away from a tiger. You need to have that mobilization. But <laughs> that's what happens. So you, you're running around, you're in grad school, you're trying to study, you're trying to make deadlines, write papers, and the cortisol levels are raging. Your blood sugar is raging. You, hard to say going back. You might have had these big peaks in, in the blood sugar and then very big crashes because you were young and you probably didn't have insulin resistance per se fully blown, but you had these spikes and these valleys and spikes and valleys. But the interesting thing is a lot of folks think that they have low blood sugar when they experience what you had, and they actually have very, very high blood sugar but the sugar is in the blood, not in the cells. So that's an indicator. I've had people who have done my programs and they'll go, oh my God, I ate this salad and I put raisins on my salad today instead of just eating the salad. And my sugar shot up to 200 and I experienced the old feeling that I used to think was low blood sugar, right? All the sugar in the blood, but nothing getting into the cells. Now that you mentioned that, can you list out some other symptoms? Because I have one of the things I've been encouraging people to do is to look beyond the skin. Don't just look at the skin symptoms and fixate on that. You need to to dig deeper into what's going on and make a list of all the different symptoms that you have. So what would be some symptoms as they're making their own personal inventory that could be indicative of blood sugar issues? Well, you just made this easy on me because what you described <laughs> as what happened to you in grad school exhaustion, middle of the day, like debilitating tiredness, or just that low energy where you go, I'll just grab a cup of coffee and, you know, it'll be fine. Go to the candy thing machine and get some sugar and I'll be fine, which is what I used to do. Not with coffee, but black tea, 10 cups a day to just make myself get. Oh my that. goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or diet Pepsi, you know, whichever Coke. Yeah. But it was the caffeine that I needed. So mm-hmm. that need for caffeine to keep you going, whether it's to get you started or to keep you going, or that slump at four in the afternoon, that's an indication. The other thing is what you mentioned was gaining weight. And I bet if you were to look back, most of that weight was around your midsection, right? Gaining weight around the midsection. That's another one. Um, Feeling hungry, even after eating a big meal. Like I just ate a big meal. Why am I ravenous? Or wanting sweets after a big meal or having cravings for sweets, but Eating them doesn't satisfy the craving. You just keep wanting to go more. And this is another connection with blood sugar and skin because all of those things throw off the skin, right? The sugars and the bad fats that we eat in the candy bars and all that sort of stuff that affect our body's ability to maintain and control inflammation, right? So those are some of them. Um, Being too wired at bedtime to go to sleep, but too tired in the morning to get up, that tired and wired feeling that we associate with adrenal fatigue and actually be um, a sign of blood sugar imbalance. You know, so those are some of the ones that the most common ones that people might see. Yeah. And I know, you know, we don't have a ton of time, so I don't want to go deep into it because you just you have a really great gift for everybody. Foods are a big piece to this. Like we can make better choices with what foods that we eat. And as you mentioned, like tropical fruits can sometimes, I know I have, I have clients that will come to me and they're eating like the whole container from Whole Foods of the cut up papaya and banana and pineapple. That's great, <laughs> but that would, that would shoot my blood sugar to the roof. Me too. It's too, it's just too much. And people don't realize sometimes that you, there is too much of a good thing that you have to oftentimes make better choices and stick within certain serving sizes. And maybe too, for you, those just aren't a good option. Um, but you've got a great 
uh, checklist that everyone who's listening can have called Foods That Can Reverse Belly Fat Fatigue and the Lack of Focus. Um, and this list includes foods and herbs that are going to help everyone who's listening begin to restore that insulin sensitivity yep. that you've talked about that we really need when the cells are having a problem. They're, they're just not listening to insulin, essentially. Exactly. And, and we'll put a link to that in the show notes. But before we sign off, just any final thoughts on like the food piece that you would love for people to know and why this would be a great resource for them? Yeah, so I'm going to say greens are your friend. And I know that as kids, you know, kids don't like to eat their greens. And they're, greens are your friend because they're loaded with nutrients and antioxidants and magnesium, which is very important for maintaining blood sugar control. They're also good for skin, right? So greens are amazing and omega-3 fats. You really, most people are out of balance with omega-6 and omega-3, which is creating inflammation. So when we eat enough of the omega-3s, and those can be on the plant side, that could be chia seeds and flax seeds and hemp seeds and walnuts and spirulina and other, you know, microgreen algaes, purslane. And then there's on the on the, the animal side fish, like deep ocean fish, but being careful where you're getting it from and not to do too much because of the mercury possibility. So those are the omega-3s. But the other side, which is the omega-6, which most people get way too much, is all your oils you know, your safflower, your sunflower, not olive because that's an omega-9, um, and your walnuts and sunflower seeds, and uh, not walnuts, I'm sorry, pecans. I, I have those two mixed in my brain. <laughs> pecans and almonds and sunflower seeds and pumpkin seeds and all those are very high in omega-6. And because of the oils that people eat a lot of and they're in processed foods, we end up getting an omega-6 to 3 dominance. And when we do that, we're more prone to inflammation. And guess what? You're not going to heal your skin. Yeah. Well, this is great. This is a great resource. And then also, too, you have a book, Unstoppable Health, Seven Breakthrough Habits to Feel Younger, Grow Stronger, and Enjoy More Energy. And I will put a link to that so that everybody can go check it out as well. And... Dr. Rita Marie, you've got a great website. Where can everybody find you? Yeah, it's just drritamarie.com. And if you're a practitioner, there's a link to my practitioner resources. And if you're not, there's just a link to other stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And hopefully we can have you back sometime and dive deeper into a lot of this stuff. Because I know that we just scratched the surface today, but it's important. And you've given everyone the tools now to go look at their own labs or to ask their doctors. So at least we start. That starting point is important. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I so appreciate Dr. Rita Marie joining us today. And as always, I'm going to put all of the links to every resource that she's mentioned in the show notes. You can head on over to the post that houses this particular episode and we'll have everything for you there. That way, all the links are easily accessible. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. As always, I deeply appreciate all of the support and the sharing that you do as our community grows we help inspire and support one another. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And don't forget, if you haven't done so yet, submit a question. We love to hear from listeners. Head on over to healthyskinshow.com. Scroll down a tad and underneath the player, you can find the section where you can submit a question. You can ask anything about your skin and what you need to do in order to start turning things around. In the meantime, I wish you a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see you the next time.